I'd like to remind everybody that this isn't just the bad news podcast, that in fact there is occasionally good news somewhere. Not here. <laughs> not, not here. Of course not. But That's some, silly. somewhere there is good news, and occasionally we need reminding of that. And I've spoken about this person before. That is, uh, what, how do you say his name? Naib Bukele. Naib Bukele. Bukele. Bukele? <laughs> I think it's Bukele. Bukele. All right. The, um, is he Prime Minister or President of... President of El Salvador. <laughs> of the good stuff. I don't know the designations. <laughs> President of El Salvador. Um, in his Twitter bio there, you can see he's dubbed himself Philosopher King, which is very based, to be honest. I wish that our leaders would have the kind of tongue-in-cheek self-confidence to be able to have a bit of fun like that, to show themselves as being more than just disgusting hateful people who despise the people that they're ruling over and go, yeah, I like the people that I'm ruling over. And in fact, I'm going to have fun with it because they like me and we can have a little bit of an amusing dialogue here. But he has been ruling uh, El Salvador for a few years now and has made most notable news from something that you'll all be aware of, the fact that he put all of MS-13 into prison. Sorry to interrupt the video, but I just want to let you know that we have a brand new selection of merch on our merch store. Uh, these won't be in the store forever, so if you do want them, go and get them now. Thanks very much. Almost overnight. And overnight, El Salvador, formerly one of the most dangerous countries in the entire world, it had one of the highest homicide rates in the entire world because it was run by MS-13, is now one of the safest countries in the entire world and is the safest country in South and Central America. I it's would... Almost, oh, sorry. Sorry. I was only, only going to add something quick. Um, recently, there was actually a World Happiness Index survey and El Salvador ranked the highest of all South American countries, which uh, kind of speaks volumes about how well it's worked as well. Yeah, that's, that's not particularly surprising to me. Um, as much as NGOs, human rights organizations, and awful lawyers will start crying, have you considered the human rights of the violent murderers and rapists? Normal people go, why? No. No, I haven't. It's almost like they're really easy to identify because they tattoo skulls on their faces. Yes, and I've spoken about this before, but it's not as though it would be that difficult to implement similar policies in the US or even the UK, where you have crime-ridden neighborhoods in parts of London. I've pointed out with, say, for instance, the drill gangs, the drill rappers in London who have uh, high rates of crime amongst themselves, literally have a map of their territories that you can access online. Um, gang, gang areas throughout America are very well known in the ghettos. They're not the, uh, the smartest bunch, are they? No, it's almost like they have a certain tendency to brag about the things that they do, mm. write songs about them, broadcast it to the world. and the Show police... off the, the proceeds of their crime on their person. They say yep. the exact Sorry. postcode they committed the crime in, which is now it's why drill rap lyrics... <laughs> yeah. they're, they're, they're admitted into criminal trials, the drill, drill rap lyrics now. Yes, which of course news outlets have been saying is racist and unfair because, Your Honour, you can't literally condemn him for admitting to his crimes in song. Have you considered that he rhymed it? Oh, no. Oh, well, if he did the rhyme, he couldn't have committed the crime. Well, no. budgeting rap who needs, is yes, who needs a lawyer if I can speak in verse? Exactly. Know, I've, uh, through, through doing that in a little couplet as well, I've exonerated myself of any and all crimes that I might be charged with in the future. So please consider that as my defense, Your Honor. Um, but Kelly has also been doing other things that are good for, the country, uh, good for the country. I know he's been a big fan of Bitcoin ever since he was voted in and his first term, and has been saying that he wanted to do things with Bitcoin. He's made Bitcoin their uh, a, 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 legal a legal tender, tender in El Salvador, as far as I'm aware. And what he's been saying is that he's decided to transfer a big chunk of his Bitcoin to a cold wallet. And I can hear Dan cooming in delight somewhere in the, in the distance. He's not in the office today, but you know, I can hear it from here. And he's been storing that cold wallet in a physical vault within their national territory. He says, you can call it our first Bitcoin piggy bank. It's not much, but it's honest work. And he said as well, part of this plan is that he is going to be buying a single Bitcoin every single day until it becomes completely unaffordable with fiat currency. Now, from what I can tell, and you might be able to explain this a bit better, Josh, is that he is trying through making it legal tender and then making it 
unaffordable outside of El Salvador. He's trying to make it so that they have a replacement for their own sovereign currency and something that could take the form of a physical tender in yeah, a way well, that gold used to. It could be a Bitcoin standard rather than a gold standard. Pretty much explained it spot on there as far as I'm aware. Yeah, also this is a way to insulate themselves from the collapse of the petrodollar because the petrodollar used to be on the gold standard and then they switched to oil because America had the hegemony on oil production and then since the Trump administration, since America were a energy independent and net exporter nation of oil and uh, liquid natural gas, uh, the Biden administration repealed lots of those that the executive orders on day one have sabotaged the American oil industry and have started doing more exports to China and enemy nations. So now BRICS has the monopoly on fossil fuels and BRICS is a parallel economic block. So as soon as the petrodollar wanes with the American foreign policy influence, he has got an energy-backed uh, currency as an alternative to the dollar to safeguard against economic collapse. Well, do you, know, want to know, do you want to know something that uh, ties into that that's actually quite remarkable? Is at the same time that this is happening and that Bukele is working towards a true sovereign independence for El Salvador so they'll be able to sustain themselves, at the exact same time, Britain, if I get the information up here, has basically started to close its steel mills. Yes, I've seen that. At the exact same time, as we are drifting further and further and further into complete dependence on the international markets, which means that we have no say in the international markets because we have no leverage ourselves, increasing reliant on foreign suppliers of, of goods, they're actually looking to get some form of independence and be able to rely on themselves, which from a national security standpoint is what you do. If you don't have national security, you are entirely um, you're able to be victimized by any other country that has power over you. This is what um, allowed America to dismantle the British Empire and take the spot as the, the largest um, and mo most powerful country in the world is that we uh, you know, over leveraged our position. We were overly reliant on global trade. And so when conflict arose, the Americans were able to um, basically. They bankrupted us, us with lend lease, essentially. Yeah, that's pretty much what happened. There's no, not criticizing Americans now. It's just the people who were in charge at the time. Yeah, we I, traded I, Palestine for the money to set up the NHS, basically. Yeah, just to make it clear, we don't associate Americans with the American ruling class. Oh, they hate their own ruling yeah. class. We, we understand you hate them as much as we do. We hate or them else. just as much as you. Yeah, as, as, which is why you're watching this podcast <laughs> right now. Um, and this tactic is going pretty well. So you can see in here, he's got, what's that, about 5,689 Bitcoin in there. And Bitcoin's huge at the moment, as far as I can tell. I saw, heard people talking about it recently, saying that it was skyrocketing. It took a big bump, yeah. It took a historic, it was it reached a historic peak, I think. I don't really follow it that closely. But I think it was I heard the, it. the cost of decrypting the blockchain had halved basically overnight, which means that the, the value of it took a large jump. My portfolio, yeah. which is completely non-existent, by the way, uh, looks great. As a result of this, uh, they had a surprise profit of the Bitcoin of $406 million in regards to how much that Bitcoin is worth. So he's got national security in mind. He's actually making money if they were to, uh, if, if, if they were to look at the value of these Bitcoin. Uh, and also, I believe he is doing schemes at the moment to try and um, get international investors to move to El Salvador so they can start profitable business in the in the country. This is a, a really important thing, actually, because I think that we like to think of the role of the government as taking our money. Well, we don't like to, but it's the way it is that they take our money and redistribute it to other things and provide us services. But actually, the government could easily make the citizens money and say, here you go, here, we've made you some money using, you know, our large scale ability to mobilize our economy. And here you are, here's a, a gift. As far as I can tell, he is approaching his role as the president as that of a CEO of a company, where he's trying to make sure that the people who are employed by the, com by the company are safe and well cared for, and that the country is as efficient as possible, as well off as possible, um, as, as, um, as, as, good as possible, really, to put it simply, uh, which is not something that we see over here. Our leaders seem to see this country as a um, oil mine that they can run dry and then leg it with the profits. And we're pretty close to running dry right now, and it looks like they're um, looting, the, looting the banks, looting all of the profits that we did have, and destroying the country and leaving nothing in its wake. So yeah. that, that's fantastic. But the main thing that he's known for, of course, is the 
making it safe? Is the destruction of MS-13 making it so that they're not viable, making it so that they're all arrested and not treated very well in prison from all the reports that I do hear from the human rights organizations? But you know what? I'm not going to be shedding any tears over that when you can see that he's been bragging about it. Statista just published the murder rates for Latin America in 2023, placing El Salvador as the lowest on the chart. Spoiler alert, the murder rate for 2024 is trending even lower. And even then, this is per 100,000 per year, they have dropped to 2.4. Blimey. That's, and remember as well, not just for the UK, who has the highest number of crimes committed by people of foreign extraction in Western Europe, but also the US, whose murder rate keeps going up in Democrat cities. This is always a political choice. He actually cares about the people who he purports to represent. And so he has chosen to clean up their country and bring them peace and prosperity like a benevolent emperor. And our leaders have decided that actually their clientele class are the criminal foreigners and random racial grievance activists. And instead, they're going to take the money of the hardworking indigenous population, give it to their clientele class, and then make off when the white people are either too dead or too upset to keep compliant anymore. Uh, I've if got you, to say this. Oh, are you going to put... I was going to say, Jam- Jamaica is obviously pretty high. Ecuador, number three is Haiti at 40.9. I can only imagine that the statistics for 2024, when they come out, there's going to, Haiti's going to rocket straight to the top of the leaderboards. But sadly, you don't win many great prizes when you win this competition. Free barbecue. Um, yeah, how dare you dismiss you, the name of General Barbecue? I thought you were going to point out uh, what sprung to mind when I saw Jamaica at the top, that in Britain, the ethnicity that commits the most violent crime is Jamaica, Jamaicans even, in Britain. Per capita, really. Well, it would be very racist of you to draw any conclusions from that. Moving on, because of how um, effective these tactics are, it seems that other populist leaders in South America and Central America are starting to take note and starting to copy uh, copy the program, which has been set out rather efficiently for them, which is just, oh, arrest all the criminals. Arrest all the criminals? You think we should arrest all the criminals and that might reduce crime? Arrest all of the murderers and rapists and it reduces rape and murder? Well, we'd never thought of that one before, or at least the leaders before had, because Argentine president Javier Millet, Josh's favorite, um, (laughs) has apparently started to implement very similar policies by arresting a load of, of criminals. Has he considered we just need more youth clubs and pool tables? He doesn't need the Falklands, though. No, he doesn't. he doesn't. Just throwing that one in there. But once again, I, I love the fact that with this, this tactic seems to also, the policy also has to include excellent promotional photos. We've arrested all of the criminals, and here's humiliating photos of them as well. <laughs> because I do have to say there is some logic in that, which is it lets other criminals know that we're serious, and it lets other criminals know that if they get caught as well, they will be similarly humiliated. Do you want to be remembered as one of these numbnuts? Yeah, these gangs operate off of fear, intimidation, and reputation. And to have these images in the social media age are actually an effective deterrent. Yeah, but so I, I'm saying that there's a, a South American libertarian to fascist pipeline, which is completely undefeated. <laughs> well, it's just, just fa- fascist. Don't give people a, a, it's not even a fascism for that. No. Because <laughs> <laughs> if you were to move to Latin America, Josh. Okay. You'd, you'd be wearing a stylish uniform and cape in no time. But that's the thing; it's not had me at cape. It's, it's not even fascism. Like he's been no, accused of, of being a. Like, he he has joked he's the world's coolest dictator, Bukele. Yeah. But he had a ninety-two percent approval rating and an eighty-five percent majority of the vote in his last election, which was so, in February. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Which is a threat to democracy. Yeah. Quite exactly. And is is just a Catholic upholding the law, like. Good guy. We don't actually, surprise, you, right? you, you don't have to resort to fascism to actually have a nice country, it turns out. President does things that the population likes, gets voted in on huge wave of appreciation. The West, this is fascism. All we yeah. want is to be wealthy and to lock up criminals. That's it. But have you considered that we need to coup an Indian in? Oh, well. Yeah. But Good the, job we've the, done that. the thing is, so he's inspired Malay, although Malay might have already been thinking about doing something like this as well. Um, but if he did inspire him directly, he's also spreading the same message to places like America, where at the most recent CPAC, he said to an audience, he said, the people of El Salvador have woken up, the global elites, they hate our success and they fear yours, no lies detected. He said that many of the US's biggest cities were in decline and have become places where crime and drugs have become the daily norm. 
How many young people have you lost on the streets of Philadelphia or San Francisco to fentanyl, he said. Can you imagine how we will be in the next 5, 10, 15 years? He urged the enthusiastic audience, put up a fight because in, in the end, it will be worth it. You will have your country back. So this is a threat. This is a clear threat to the ruling class, our leaders that we have right now, because he is presenting a way out. You do not have to be ruled by people who hate you and want to see you hurt, who want to see you murdered, who want to see your family raped or transitioned or any number of other horrible things. You do not have to be ruled by people who want you impoverished and in the gutter. You can be ruled by people who actually give a damn about the country and want you to succeed. And our leaders are terrified of that because they are not the people who want to do that. They are not the populists. This is why we have the populist threat that's going right now. Because populists, like Bukele, are people who say, you don't have to live like this. It's kind of amazing to me that they're trying to t- turn populist into like a dirty word, because it's, got the, you know, it's made up of the word popular. It's just like, we can't give the people what they want. My goodness, they've got to be predated on and stolen from. But that's genuinely it. Bukele represents a major threat, as you said, because, again, he is an example of why all of this is a choice. The elite constantly position all of these social ills as an inevitability, as Tony Blair once said of globalization. Debating that is as futile as debating if autumn follows the summer. So it's always going to happen. You might as well appoint us the managers who would steward you into the new age. Managed decline. Exactly. And now Bukele is saying, no, all of this is a choice. Your children don't have to overdose from drugs and you don't have to be shoved in front of trains by homeless people and give all your money to criminal foreigners. Actually, I've got a nice country over here and look how quickly I turned it around. And if you just elected leaders or had leaders whose underlings did their bidding effectively, were they in office, properly, you would have that nice country too. Yeah. But once again, our leaders aren't the ones who are going to do this. And so our leaders, so, well, the only way that this is going to get done is if we get ousted. And who knows if we get ousted, the people who replace us might not be that fond of us, seeing as we destroyed their country and had all of these horrible things happen to them. We might even be liable for criminal charges here because of the level of corruption that exists in the West right now. So they say, okay, this is awful. We best call this fascism. We best call this undemocratic and get people to hate it So that, uh, and maybe even throw economic sanctions their way as Joe Biden has threatened to do to El Salvador in the past few months because we want to nip this in the bud before we end up in prison or worse. Uh, but Bukele really loves playing up this image of himself because he shares all sorts of stuff on Twitter. He even shared Carl on Twitter. He retweeted <laughs> me before. I'm very happy he, with this. He shared, I, I was going through his Twitter and it, this was just shared on his page, which was Bukele's New York, Bukele's the world, criminals in jail, Bitcoin, cold storage, philosopher king, golden age. I'm coming for you, brother. <laughs> it feels like, you're right, it feels like a WWE promo. <laughs> I, I have to agree, of all of the criticisms that I've seen of um, Bukele, the one I agree with the most is Dave the Distributists, which is the he, 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 you know, everything he's doing is excellent, but he doesn't have the style. Of Go a... back to the last image, actually. Like, he just looks better in a suit. Now, oh, yeah. he, should, he, he should be he dressing like Gaddafi, and... basically. Like, like um, Tim Curry he in needs, Modern Conquer. He needs a cape. Yeah. He needs the, uh, it wouldn't be good for the, the whole fascist branding, but the Pinochet sort of look of a little, <laughs> little cape. <laughs> I agree. He needs a cape. If you're a South American leader who's going to do stuff like this that actually benefits your public, you've got to wear a cape. Come on, man. Uh, but he's also saying as well, in response to everything that's going on in Haiti right now, because um, Ian Miles Chong was posting about how Haiti's collapsed. Here's all of these horrible images. We know that people are eating each other. He just says, we can fix it. We'll need a UNSC resolution, the consent of the host country and all the mission expenses to be covered. But also we can fix it, which is he, him just saying to the international community, whether you want to say that such a thing really exists, he's saying, listen, this is a horrible thing that's happening. If you actually care about people of, in Haiti who are being brutalized and murdered and literally eaten, if you actually want to show that you care about these people, give me the keys. Give me the keys and I will fix it. And you know what? I reckon he probably would be able to. But I like that he's kind of trying to arrange some uh, a superhero group of South and Central Americans where he's at the head of them, like a Justice League, a South American confederation that will be able to fix all of the problems down there. And I would be in total support of that to a certain extent because all of the corruption that goes on down there, especially the cartels, 
if you were to have a load of leaders band together and fix the cartel problem in South America, that would solve a lot of problems for North America as well through ferrying up illegal immigrants and ferrying up a lot of drugs. That would solve so much. If There's also the fact something. that if an outside force goes into a country, they're going to be less prone to be corrupt because they are this outside entity. They're not embedded in the culture, mm. which allows people to be more corrupt because everyone kind of knows each other. Everyone's got a hand in each other's pockets. Whereas if they send over, you know, presumably, soldiers and police officers and, and the likes to restore order, well, they're going to have no reason to accept this because they're on a salary they're being paid for mm. and you know it might happen to some extent but not to the same extent as it would domestically I'd, I'd also trust Bekele far more than the American State Department to clear it up because the last time the American State Department so-called went over there to spread democracy somewhere Joe Biden's brother got house building contracts so I, I highly doubt mm. Bekele is going to sink to the same level of corruption because he hasn't yet and he's already got priors to show that he knows how to do this sort of stuff effectively credit to Dave the distributors who I mentioned a second ago for the segment title because he posted this saying is this guy making a grab for Caesar of Central America I'm not against it I'm not against it at all but of course as I mentioned this is a threat to our leaders so they have to start spreading propaganda about how actually this is a bad thing if you have somebody who comes in and says that he's going to fix your problems and actually follows up on that if it's not just empty rhetoric we need everybody to know that that's a bad thing and not just pushing empty rhetoric forward is authoritarianism is fascism Yada, yada, yada. You get articles like this. The populist threat, how Bukele and Malay undermine democratic progress in Latin America. Remember, 83, 85% of the vote on the recent popular election that happened in February, unde uh, undemocratic. Yeah. This is just undemocratic. And what's the reasons they give here? They say Bukele is implementing Manojura policies without regard to the cost to human rights and constitutional order. Uh, Boric, one of the other South and Central American leaders, represents social demands for change through democratic means, blah, blah, blah. Unfortunately, this possibility of more Bukele springing up is now becoming a reality as more Latin Americans lose patience with democracies, you mean the corruption of their native countries and their governments and political classes that haven't become more inclusive, just or equitable, love that they've got to try and sprinkle DEI into it somehow. Recent, you see, Latin Americans, they just hate that their countries aren't gayer. They're clearly that's, white supremacists. That's the problem. Recent events signal the region might be at a critical juncture between a continued democratic trajectory and erosion towards authoritarianism. Latin Americans are increasingly fed up with their elected leaders. This is fertile ground for authoritarianism. So what they're actually fed up with, what they're actually tired with, is not democratic elections. It's democratic means that these people are always going on about, which is a code word for sitting on your hands and arguing about how you can best do absolutely nothing while your country burns. All democratic means is, is people shouting at one another, saying, you're not doing nothing enough. And they shout, stand up and say, no, I'm doing plenty of nothing. You're not doing nothing enough. And actually, you're more racist. Yeah. What the people want are actions. They want actions because they speak louder than words. They speak louder than any kind of rubbish parliamentary questions, PMQs, whatever your country has. We don't want to see your guys getting up and making a big bluster. We want to see them actually doing useful things for the country, which they don't do. You've spoken about this recently on your Tom Linton talk show, where you spoke about how Britain needs a Bukele, and you were referencing this article from the Times saying the new autocrats driving global democracy to a 20-year low. Now, they could have not made him look cool in like his own stained glass window there. <laughs> you were joking he, earlier. He, he's got the Fred Durst backwards cap on right there. <laughs> <laughs> he's about to drop some mad rhymes. <laughs> well, actually, if he's compared to Fred Durst, maybe not mad rhymes, maybe <laughs> mediocre lack rhymes, lackluster and mediocre <laughs> rhymes. Yeah. So they talk about the Bertelsmann Stiefung latest index revealing the rise of media censorship, unfair elections, and curbs of civil protest. So the Bertelsmann Transformation Index (BTI) index. Uh, released every two years since 2005, assesses 137 countries classed as developing, largely the world's poorer nations, or transitioning, such as former, com uh, former communist bloc states in Europe. Which this chart basically uh, it charts how close your country is to becoming a corrupt shithole like the USA is slowly morphing into. 
the closer your country is to the US and everybody wants to co uh, copy the US's system as it works right now, right? That just means you're more democratic. Unless Donald Trump is in charge, in which case all of a sudden it's a fascist totalitarian state again. But the closer your country is to the US, the more democratic you are, the more your country works and locks up criminals and supports its own citizens, the less you are like the US, the more undemocratic you are. That's how these rules work. Autocratic rule and populism can be fueled by the COVID pandemic, numerous conflicts such as the Russian invasion of Ukraine, a sharp rise in food costs and economic turmoil. So remember that when we locked you up for almost two years on dubious grounds, shall we say, that was democracy in action. But when these people do things that you actually want them to do, that's not democracy. So those are the rules. I want everybody to be clear. Since the survey began two decades ago, the index was not included Western democracies, democracies such as the US, the UK, or France, which are considered to be consolidated democracies, broadly defined as those which were members of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development prior to 1989. They were all left out. So they're already locked down under American hegemony. So they don't count. We don't assess those because if we were to actually assess them fairly and objectively, it might look, look great. A lot, lot, lot more stabby foreigners there. Yeah. Yeah. But according to this democracy, this incredibly fair metric across the world has slipped to its lowest standing in decades. And they include El Salvador in that. Why? Because the self styled world's coolest dictator declared a state of emergency, arrested gang members without trial. Almost 2% of the adult population has been arrested, prompting outcry from human rights groups. No, no murderous what, what, gang members, no. As always, imagine you're just a, a normie. I know you would have to drop at least 20 IQ points, but imagine you're a normie and you're reading this with no context and you say, of the adult population, that's not missing context at all. He's just arresting people for no reason. He's just arresting people because it's fun to do that. But doesn't I the suppose. US have a higher percentage of the adult population in incarcerated than El Salvador does? Possibly. I don't. I, I think I saw mention somewhere of them having one of the highest prison populations in the entire world okay. at the moment because they've got about 80,000 people in prison right now purely from these arrests and raids. So I wouldn't be shocked if they have a higher percentage. But still, they leave out all the context of the reasons why. And they say violence has drastically reduced. Yeah, it works, but there is unease at Bukele's tightening authoritarianism. He won a second term in February despite a constitutional ban on running for consecutive terms, which, if I remember correctly, their Supreme Court um, lifted that ban because of how popular he is, because of how effective he is, and because of the fact they probably know that whoever would replace him would probably be some kind of US or international puppet who immediately released all of the murderers and rapists, and they thought that might be bad for the country. So people that thought the Constitution was plastic enough to persecute Donald Trump for completely spurious charges now think the Constitution is some ironclad thing that the will of the people cannot go against, especially if he actually does the things they like. Good to know. Yeah, exactly. So take notes. Your leaders hate you, but things are going well in other parts of the world, and hopefully sometime in the near future, we can start to have our own dictator Caesar to <laughs> save us from the mess that we're in. Hi folks, thanks for watching. If you'd like to support us, you can go over to lowcities.com, sign up for £5 a month, and this gives you access to our vast library of premium content, such as this example, which is Stellius' Symposium series, in which he is discussing the meditations of Marcus Aurelius. And if you want further updates from us, you can go over and follow our Twitter account at lowcities underscore com.